It's my uh, greatest pleasure and honor, in fact, to be able to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Harvey Goldstein. Um, well, Harvey is an old friend of mine. Um, I don't want to say how long ago. I went to the Institute of Education in London to do my PhD, and then my husband and I went together, and my husband was Harvey's uh, PhD student. So the connection went back a very long way. Um, and actually, Harvey is extremely, he's extremely well known, he's done so much contribution to the, I mean, to various areas in relation to using, well, to me, because I'm not in that field, so it's more like you know, statistical methods, but he's actually um, done a lot of, um, you know, groundbreaking work in the area of multi-level modeling, and uh, he actually, um, with his team, invented the, um, Multi ML. Well, in fact, it, it started with MLN, yeah, and then um, and then now it's ML Win. Uh, so, and he in fact has been helping us uh, over the um, from Monday to th um, to Wednesday with um, you know running workshops and also um, consultancies for us uh, in relation to multi level modeling. Um, Professor Goldstein is uh, at the moment uh, with he's a professor of social uh, statistics at the University of Bristol. Um, but and before that, he was, as you can guess, he was a professor of statistical um, methods as a, at the Institute of Education until 2005. Um, he is at the moment also um, serving on a part-time basis um, um, on professorial appointments at the. Um, University College London Institute of Child Health and also uh, a visiting professor at the London School of Hygiene. Um, he's a member of the Council of the Royal Sto Statistical Society, the chair of, the, uh, of its educational st strategy group. Uh, he's also joint editor of the Journal of the Royal so Statistical Society and he was awarded the Society's Guy Medal in Silver in 1998 and is a fellow of the, and an elected uh, fellow of the British Academy in 1997. So all these goes on and on and on, and so you won't be able to hear anything if I keep on talking about this, but um, I'm very, um, we are very lucky to have um, Harvey uh, agreeing to give us a keynote on traditional large-scale educational assessment and the incorporation of digitally derived information. So going into the 21st century, um, there are things that we, I mean, so actually Harvey's, one of Harvey's um, major work is in the area of uh, large-scale international comparative studies. So, so we still have comparative studies, we still have large-scale studies. Uh, what does it mean when we now go into a digital um, world? So without further ado, I would like to invite all of you to join me in welcoming Professor Goldstein. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy, and uh, my thanks to the organising committee uh, for inviting me to uh, give this talk to you. I'm delighted to be back uh, in Hong Kong, and as you will uh, see, I have now recovered my voice, which I had almost lost on Wednesday after giving uh, some workshops. You will also be very pleased to know that there are going to be absolutely no equations uh, in my talk. Uh, this is very much, uh, for me, a, a think piece. Um, as, as Nancy said, I have been involved in large-scale assessment, comparative assessment. Uh, I've analysed data from PISA, from TIMS. Uh, I have, in many cases, been quite critical uh, of, of some of these large-scale assessments. Not so much because they're large-scale assessments, but because of the uses to which people tend uh, to give these assessments, to make inferences that I think maybe go beyond uh, the data. So in uh, the new world of new technology, digital technology, I think there are a number of challenges um, confronting people who do large-scale quantitative assessment. So as I go through, I'm going to discuss what I think some of these challenges are, 
how we might meet them, what we should, and perhaps what we shouldn't do. Okay, so the issues, the main issues, uh, as I see them, I set out on this first slide. First of all, um, I think it's common to distinguish educational assessment into assessment which is, call it what you like, formative, but essentially assessment is meant to promote individual learning. Okay, it's the, it's the trust between the student and, and their teacher. Um, and it involves assessing what the student can do, where they are, what they're likely to be able to do. And the other kind of assessment uh, that we talk about is assessment for understanding educational systems. It's large-scale uh, assessment. It tries to understand why things happen, how children learn in relation to the characteristics, to the characteristics in the curriculum, um, to educational policy, to the way schools are organised, social background, and so on. So it's more looking outwards. Uh, it's trying to explain what's happening on a large scale in general terms. Um, so that's the, the third bullet point. Um, digital information um, is now coming in in many ways, um, not just in personal assessment, informative assessment, um, but through the assessment instruments themselves, uh, through the tests. So we're beginning to see some of the large-scale programs like TIMS and PISA beginning to use um, things like computer adaptive testing, um, using IT, measuring IT skills, uh, and so on. So it's coming in quite quickly. The methodology is there. Uh, it's beginning to be used. And that raises a number of issues that, that I've been talking about. Um, and not only that, of course, there's the whole of the other um, world out there in terms of social media, uh, give it its broad terms, uh, which potentially tells you a lot um, about learners, about students, about people who use it. They would do things on social media uh, that are not captured by formal testing procedures, however sophisticated. So there is a big question out there about the extent to which we should begin to think of incorporating what people do on social media, if we can get hold of that kind of information, and that's an issue, um, into our formal procedures for understanding how people learn. How does it relate to the traditional ways we have thought about measuring learning? That's not a trivial question. The point is that the technology has now given us the opportunity to do that measurement. There are actually quite a lot of people out there already researching social media and tracking all kinds of things. There are the security services, as we know, uh, that are tracking everything we do as citizens. There are researchers uh, attempting to track uh, what teenagers do using social media. There are issues, there are ethical issues, there are issues of consent. There are all those issues that I think we're all familiar with. My concern is once you've dealt with those issues, once you've satisfied those issues, how do you then use that information within what is the traditional framework of testing? You see, moving, for example, in something like PISA or TIMS um, to an on-screen assessment or an adaptive so I've said it is really not doing anything new. It's using the new technology, but in the old way. You need to think about that a little bit. It's not actually setting up a new paradigm for testing. It's simply updating the methodology, the technology um, that's there to make it easier. So. The claims, for example, for adaptive testing uh, are that uh, you can uh, 
assess an individual more accurately because you can home in on the assist, uh, an individual's actual underlying achievement. There's some issues to do with that that I will talk about later. Um, but that's not really new. It's a new way of doing the same thing we were doing before. So there's another big issue out there. This, I say, is a thought piece. And I haven't given an awful lot of thought to this. But it does seem to me that there is information out there. There's information about people's behavior that is related to their learning. A lot of learning goes on through social media. Um, it goes on through formal uh, courses, of course, on the web, the MOOCs and all the rest of it, um, and the informal courses. All that is out there. How can we bring it in? Should we bring it in? And if so, how can we do that? Okay. Um, one of the issues about the uh, new information that we may want to capture that we haven't really faced, I think, in traditional assessment in the same way, is how do we make an assessment of the quality of this information? So if you're conducting, uh, traditionally, a test uh, to measure some kind of attainment in language or in mathematics, uh, there are all sorts of procedures that are enshrined in the textbooks about how you create good tests, how you ensure that the way you test people meets certain quality standards, you how to ensure that it has a certain level of validity, reliability and so on. Over the last century, we've developed ways, um, slowly, of being able to measure that. Now we're confronted with data we have no control over. If we're going to tap in to some of the digital data out there that people are using, they're interacting with, we don't have control over those data directly. Those data are just there. Um, they, they obey certain rules. The rules are determined by the technology, the way people use them. But how do we determine whether they meet certain standards, certain criteria that we might want uh, to um, actually adopt with these data, and how do we link those with our traditional criteria? So there's a whole range of issues. As soon as we begin to think out of the current way in which we do educational assessment, we're confronted by a whole range of new issues. So, um, I've already mentioned um, what I call digitised testing, and I want to say a little bit more about that now. Um, so, I mentioned adaptive testing, um, and basically what you do with adaptive testing, because you can interact somebody with a digital device, a computer, a screen, um, is you can actually determine from the responses that they start giving you back roughly where they are, what they can respond to and what they can't respond to. And consequently, you can adapt uh, what you next ask them in terms of what they previously told you about themselves. Okay. Well, this sounds like a great idea, and, and it's certainly in use. Uh, in many places, and it's one of the ways in which one could begin to think of bringing in other kinds of electronic data, for example, social media data, that can begin to tell you something about individuals that you might then want to tailor um, in terms of the questions you might then want to put to them um, to each individual separately. The problem is, um, and this is uh, an uns a well understood problem, is that sometimes you can go wrong. Um, because uh, the answers people give to questions don't directly reflect what they know or what they can do, 
Uh, there's a random element to them. Uh, so maybe someone gets something right by chance um, and that leads the machine off in the wrong direction. Or sometimes it could happen the other way around. Now, some of these algorithms can continually uh, adapt themselves. But there is a problem that this isn't uh, a, a well-specified way of, of working, of actually eliciting what happens from individuals. And the reason I mention it is that I think this is probably going to be even more true when you're using information outside the normal formal testing procedure to try and tell you something about individuals. Because the way individuals use information technology is going to be context dependent. So the context in which messages flow through social media, through people's responses to online courses, whatever it happens to be, depends not just on what you might think of as some kind of underlying characteristics of individuals, but also on whether they were feeling very well that day. Um, uh, there are all kinds of issues to do with that. How do you deal with that? How do you stop yourself being misled? How do you cope with the randomness associated with people's responses to questions? This is already an issue in informal testing, as we know it. Uh, it's going to be even more of an issue when we deal with uh, the new forms of amassing information about people. Okay. Um, I've already talked about um, some of this, but let me also just say a little bit about this dimensionality assumption. Something I've written about and complained about uh, in many cases before. Built in uh, to most of these algorithms is this, so if you're measuring kind of mathematics or some component uh, of mathematics, is that uh, you're lining up individuals on some scale whatever it happens to be, mathematics achievement, mathematics ability, call it what uh, you like. Um, but maybe you've got it wrong. Maybe the scale is not one dimensional. Maybe it's two or three dimensional. Um, and maybe what you're doing is somehow collapsing over those three dimensions. And what happens is that you're averaging individual responses. So you're not picking up what individuals can do on all the dimensions that may be there. Partly because you don't necessarily know what those dimensions are before you start. So one of the things that people do when they analyse test data is they analyse it to study its dimensionality. Okay. Well, if you're doing adaptive testing, um, then uh, one of the things you might want to do is to study dimensionality, but at the same time, um, you've got to produce an algorithm uh, that's moving people in different directions. Uh, you're going to have to move them in directions along more than one dimension at a time. How do you do that? That is not a straightforward uh, thing to do. It can, it can become very complex. So there is this issue of dimensionality um, along how many dimensions do individuals operate. Now, it may be convenient, um, and indeed, I wouldn't argue with this, to summarise how people perform, or how countries perform, along one or perhaps two or three dimensions, essentially averaging uh, over what might be there, a multi-dimensional space. Um, and it may be convenient to average that. But for the purposes of research, purposes of understanding, that may not be the right way to go. At the end of the day, you might want to do that, um, but uh, if you do that without understanding how you got there, without first of all understanding the underlying dimensionality, uh, then you may be misleading yourself, you may be covering up some really interesting things about how people learn, how people behave. Excuse me.
I don't want to sound too negative about this. Um, because there are all kinds of things that computerized testing or testing using digital media can do that you couldn't do before. And the great thing, of course, um, is that uh, you interact uh, with the media. Um, and so you can do things that you couldn't do before. You can attempt to elicit creativity. You cre create scenarios um, that maybe are different for each individual. So there's an issue uh, about comparability, but nevertheless, um, you can allow individuals to guide uh, or, or to sort of provide their own way through a, a digital scenario with all kinds of ways of demonstrating creativity. Okay. So rather than just measuring learning, uh, you've got all sorts of possibilities of measuring other things as well. How you actually assess those, um, how you score them and so on, is, is an issue, it's a task, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, but the possibility is there, so you can simulate real life project tasks. Um, one of the features of many educational systems, certainly in the UK and I think probably in Hong Kong, that the role of project work, the kind of practical work in many subjects, has become diminished um, for all sorts of reasons. And one of the ways of getting some of that practice back into the curriculum, of course, is via simulated tasks uh, using the screen. I'm not suggesting that's a, a total replacement, um, but it's one way of thinking uh, about a replacement. Um, also, because it's digitised, uh, you can deal with large numbers of respondents, of students, simultaneously. So rather than the, in the assessment for learning context, um, having this interaction between teachers and pupils, you can to some extent supplant that with the interaction between a teacher-controlled digital environment uh, and students. And that actually could be made very efficient in the sense that many students can access it at the same time. Um, so, let me carry on. Um, one of the, I've, I've talked about um, acquiring data. Um, it's an issue, how you do it, do you have consent to do it? But one of the ways of acquiring data is, of course, that there are already large-scale databases out there. So it's not digital uh, media, it's not social media anymore, but there's large-scale administrative databases on individuals. Again, I'm not familiar with, with Hong Kong, um, but uh, certainly in the UK and in many other countries, particularly in uh, the Scandinavian countries, um, there is a vast amount of information on every single individual um, often scattered, not linked together, um, but it's separate. So uh, in the UK we have something called the National Pupil Database, which is a longitudinal record of every student from the time they start school actually right through to the time they finish education, for example, university. All linked together, um, available centrally, and also to some extent, available uh, for research purposes uh, and potentially available um, as part of an assessment system because some of the assessments are actually part of that system. Not the formative assessment, but there's no reason in principle why such a database uh, couldn't uh, be expanded. So the idea that uh, you can capture not just by successive one-off surveys like PISA um, what's going on in the education system, but you can maintain uh, a database over time that actually in many ways can yield similar kinds of information 
but it has tremendous advantages in the sense that theoretically it captures everybody. In practice, of course, it doesn't, uh, but theoretically it does. Um, it links data longitudinally, and this is terribly important because many of the large scale assessments that we're used to, um, PISA, TIM, and so on, are not longitudinal. And in that sense, they fail many of the tests for research purposes. They're not really uh, designed or able um, to say very much about causality. And the reason is that they're cross-sectional. That, I think, is a, a tremendous mistake. I think it's a great pity. I think millions of pounds have been wasted uh, on acquiring purely cross-sectional data when you didn't have to do that. You could have acquired longitudinal data. But that's another lecture now. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but in the new technological age, these things become less and less relevant. They don't entirely disappear. We need to be concerned about all the issues um, of designing test items, how to capture data, and so on, that are already issues with these large scale assessments. But you don't have to, every four years or every three years, set up a new assessment system. I think that's, that's the old days now. But that, you know, we've had the technology, you don't need to do that anymore. Um, why should you do it? It's inefficient. Um, now, I'm not saying uh, that uh, there are not problems to be overcome. But there are real problems, and I think there's big problems about consent, individual consent to be part of those kinds of systems. Um, and a lot of that is based on whether there is trust, um, and that in some uh, systems is in short supply. Um, so there are other kinds of consent, ethical issues about keeping data secure, and so on. I, I, I'm well aware of, of these problems, but that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be thinking. Uh, about how to do that. So I see my prediction for the future. Now, I, I, I hesitate to make predictions because um, I, and my predictions are usually wrong. For example, I predicted that the Labour Party would get more seats than the Conservatives in the recent election. I even put some money on it. Uh, well, it, it, I might have, it might have happened, but it didn't quite happen. So uh, don't trust my predictions. <laughs> Um, they didn't do too badly, actually, but that's not the story. Um, my prediction is in 10, 15 years' time, we will be moving away from these systems like PISA to much more stable, ongoing systems um, that are maintained as a matter of course. Now, if you're maintaining an educational system, a database, of course, there's no reason in principle why you shouldn't link that to a database that's also being maintained, for example, by your health service. So we have databases for our health service in the UK right from birth, right through, um, using hospital uh, statistics, using general practitioner statistics, where everybody actually uh, is there in one form or another. It's not complete, um, but that could be linked to the educational. Database. And there are many people <coughs> beginning to think about that kind of linkage. You may not want to link it permanently, for, for, for lots of reasons, possibly to do with privacy. Um, but from time to time, you may want to carry out a linkage to answer uh, certain questions. So I think in this kind of new technological age, we can already see that there are those tools out there that really should be forcing us to rethink how we do assessment, how we, how we track individuals and understand um, how they learn um, and what their attainment is. <clears throat> so, I mentioned the ethical problems. Um, data quality, again, especially for things like social media. But also, if I'm thinking about administrative systems, you have to be careful about the data quality there because they're not collected generally for research purposes. And we know that, especially in health, uh, but also in education, uh, that people are not too worried if a code is put in the wrong place. Uh, there's not the same 
care and attention to accuracy as there would be with a research study. So those are issues that uh, one needs to think about. Um, and the other issue, I guess, is, of course, you can have too much data. There really are, this is megadata. It's really big data, petabytes of, of data. Well, maybe in 20 years' time, this won't seem so much of a problem. But at the moment, I think it's formidable. How do you deal, how do you summarize, uh, begin to kind of process such vast quantities of data? People are working on this. Um, but, but it is still an issue. And hopefully it's an issue that people find ways of, of tackling. Um, so I've already talked about um, information quality, and I've talked about linking data. And linking of data is something that maybe we haven't thought about very much in educational assessment, but I think it's going to be increasingly important. Linking data from different sources, bringing it together, on the same individuals, I think are going to be increasingly important. Because one single study, again, talking about something like TIMS, you're collecting data, you're collecting social data, you're collecting educational data, but you're not collecting a lot of health data, for example. <clears throat> but you could, in principle, get that by linking to the files that already exist on those individuals. But data linkage, you have to be very careful about. Um, it is problematic, um, and it's partly because if I'm entering somebody's name in a database, I could misspell it, um, and it could be misspelled in two different databases. And if you come to link, and if name is one of the linking fields, uh, then you start having problems. So there's a lot of work going on, it's one of the interests we currently have in, in Bristol, about how, about how you link. Um, not so much how you link accurately, uh, but how you use what we've come to call probabilistic linking. How do you cope with the inevitable differences, the inevitable problems of linking the same people together? And there are ways of doing it. They're quite sophisticated and we've only begun to think about it. But it's really just a warning. It's not a straightforward procedure. There are lots of problems to do with it. But it doesn't mean to say as it can't happen. And governments, of course, certainly in the UK, have publicly said they want to disseminate data and they want data to be linked. I don't think the governments t understand at all what it means. Um, it sounds good. Uh, but let's, let's be grateful for small mercies. They've said it. Um, and there are ways of doing it. And we need, how, need to find out how to do it efficiently. Okay, um, so one of the issues I think that is debated, um, certainly in large-scale assessments, uh, when data are acquired digitally, is how do we relate those? How do we make them comparable to data that we acquired by pencil and paper, with ticking boxes before? because the medium is different, the context in which the data are quite different. Now, I think that activity is okay, but I just wonder whether we should be worried about it. Um, the context in which people respond clearly is going to be important. And if you get people to respond, in terms, if you're interested in mathematics attainment, if you get them to respond in different contexts, you're going to pick up, probably, different aspects of what it is they know and what it is they can do. So maybe there is no comparability. Maybe what we're doing is actually context-dependent. Uh, and this is something that runs through the whole of assessment, theory, uh, and debate. This issue of comparability. I've said this in, in other places, um, but a lot of the um, assumptions that go into large-scale uh, assessments such as PISA are predicated on the assumption that you can have comparability uh, for the same test, you can do the same test, translate it in different 
uh, countries, different educational systems. I'm not sure I believe that. To some extent it may be true. Uh, but we've done work, even within Europe, for example France uh, and the UK, um, where we've shown, to my satisfaction, that the context in which the questions are asked, because the question is never abstract, they're always asked in context. It may be a, a particular practical applied context, um, maybe more abstract context. That context is important because uh, people respond to the context. Context may be more or less familiar. Some people may be happier with context than others. They're not just using something you might think of as mathematics ability to respond to a question. They're using all sorts of things to respond to a question. And so the context actually is going to elicit different aspects of the way people work and think. Okay. So if we're thinking of, as we switch to new forms of gathering information, we may have to give up some of the notions of trying to make it comparable to what we did in the past. This is new. Let's treat it as new. So there's a challenge. I'm sure not everybody is going to agree with that. Um, but I raise it as, as an issue, at least, that's worth thinking about. <clears throat> um, so I've said something about um, digital media. Um, I don't want to say any more about it. There are big problems, but there are big payoffs as well. Because what is being captured in digital media now is how people spend their time. Um, so not just in the artificial situation of being in school or being tested, uh, but how they interact with each other, how they interact with the outside world, outside of, of those things. And potentially, as I'm sure everybody here is aware, uh, there is all sorts of information that we need to be thinking about how to capture uh, from those kinds of media. Okay, I think my voice is going to last. Um, so, um, the, other, the other thing, of course, that I have mentioned is, of course, these digital devices are not <coughs> just to capture mental processes, they can capture physical processes as well. So, you can now track people, um, you can track, uh, for example, their physical activity by giving them devices they can wear, so uh, you can look at all their physical activity throughout the day. Um, you can measure, I was reading this morning uh, in the newspaper uh, about a study in Hong Kong, tracking how people encounter pollution in the home and the journey to work uh, and so on, using a small device they carry around with them 24 hours a day. And, and these things are, are mushrooming. These things you're going to get smaller and smaller, easier and easier to use, capturing more and more things about people, what they do about the environment, and so on. So, uh, <clears throat> as we move forward in our assessments, we should be thinking of how to bring in all these other issues about what people are doing physically in particular, so we, we can relate those to our educational assessments. Now, it's not cheap, certainly at the moment, um, and it may be lots of people already thinking about that, uh, but it is a challenge in terms of how you might do it. Um, and you can provide data that you can't easily get uh, in other ways. The other nice thing about it is that if you're providing people with those kinds of instruments, you can, to some extent, do a lot of quality assurance as well. So there's a lot of control uh, you can exercise. So, to wind up, um, let me just try and give an overview of, of what my thinking has been. Um, first of all, the obvious one is that we can no longer ignore um, the acquisition of digital information. We, we've got to embrace it. That's not a message anybody here, I'm sure, will 
uh, disagree with. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think that perhaps are places where this is, uh, I know in the UK, um, it's, uh, it's not something that goes down well, this thought, in a lot of traditional places that have relied on traditional forms of testing and assessment um, and switching to digital assessment, bringing digital ideas is, is both new but it's also expensive um, and, and so there are barriers. Um, I've talked about wearable devices um, and how that can really capture a lot of things that might be interesting. Um, okay, the other thing that I haven't uh, talked about is these devices on the whole capture things about the individual, but of course you could conceive of these devices being extended to capture interactions between individuals. And this is a more difficult problem, um, and there's quite a lot of theory out there uh, about how you deal with interactions between people, network theory and, and so on. Um, but actually having devices, digital devices, that can pull in that information, I think, is quite a challenge, um, but a tremendous payoff uh, if you can begin to make any headway there. Because, yes, yeah, students are social beings. We're all social beings. We don't exist. We don't behave. We don't learn. Well, a few of us may learn individually outside of other people. We learn from other people, in collaboration with other people. So the real goal here, we've never been able to do this very well in traditional testing, is maybe we can begin to think about how we might do this. Um, how we might tap into the way people collaborate to learn. Okay? I know there's been a lot of thought about collaborative learning, but the ability of digital devices to monitor that, I think is new. It's difficult. Um, it's not going to be straightforward, um, but it's one of the places I think that uh, digital technology can really make inroads. The whole idea of collaborative learning, not only assessing it, but promoting it as well. So there's a whole lot of issues. I'm interested in a lot of methodology, but like how do you process the data you get? That's not trivial. That's really quite difficult. Um, but other people are interested in technology, developing the technology. Um, okay, uh, and the last point is for me, uh, the challenges are exciting. It keeps people like me in employment, which is very useful. Um, and I, I see no way in which people like me are going to be unemployed in the future with all these data coming in. You're going to need us uh, more. Anyway, thank you for listening. Your point about get okay. So gathering information about learning. Um, I mean, traditionally, if we want to assess people's learning, we were doing it through tasks like um, say exercises and so on. But then you were talking about now you can actually uh, look at how people actually behave. Um, you know, to see their performance. Now, in a way, it's not t entirely new. So if you think about, say, um, psychologists looking at young children growing up, and you sort of see, okay, you give them blocks. What do they do with the blocks? And if you, how do they interact with each other? So those are sort of like behavioral observations. Now you're talking about actually observations of that, I mean, we now have this term called 
digital footprint, right? So you can have these digital footprint of different things. Um, but it becomes a little bit more difficult to sort of conceptualize. And where to start? I mean, one can see, okay, it seems to be possible, but, it, but to me, it's still quite elusive. So, say, if you were to be um, thinking about this, where would be a good starting point in sort of think, I mean, because it's like digging gold. I mean, you know that there might be something there, but then you, you, you have a kind of sense of where might be easier or might, might be more profitable to start with. So because this is a think piece, I'm just wanting to see whether um, there could be some, some thoughts on that. Okay, no, it's, it's a good question, and I have <coughs> given a great deal of thought to that. Um, I mean, the, but the point about having, using digital media rather than people to actually, for example, psychologists to elicit responses from people is that actually you can do it more efficiently. You, you can do it on a much larger scale. Um, so you're not limited to just dealing with 20 children. You, you can deal with hundreds of children. Now you're not, it's not the same thing. You know, look, looking at something responding on a screen is not the same thing as doing it physically. I'm not suggesting it is, and I'm not suggesting uh, it will take its place. It will supplement it, it will complement it. So one of the things you might say is you could look through those kinds of, of tasks of how you elicit uh, where children are at certain stages of development um, and ask them how you would do that uh, using digital media. Um, but I, I confess I haven't given a lot, a, lot of, a lot of thought to that. So I don't think it's necessarily going to replace that because it is, it is different and the context is different and that's how I want to approach it. When we think about assessment, there's another aspect of it. I mean, okay, well, we want, especially in the, in the context of education, we, need, we want to be thinking about uh, what are the contributing factors um, that influences um, development. And oftentimes, we would be looking at, um, say, surveys for contextual data, but um, with the new technology, there could be also different dimensions of uh, ways of getting um, access to it. Yeah. And also, but it's, and what you said in, in terms of the interaction side is also uh, very attractive, particularly if we say we think about children growing up, it's actually that we were talking about family influences. Now family influence is not just as, I mean, we, we, we now tend to reduce it to as yes. So, um, does your father have a degree or your mom uh, have what kind of work? But then what kind of exposure do children uh, expose to? It's not just digital. So, but then how do we get access to it? I think it's another goal mind there, but how do we get access to it? Well, I, I think that's right. <clears throat> and it's part of what I was saying at the end about how do you uh, capture interactions between people. How do you catch interactions between parents and children? Um, you know, what, what do you need to do? What devices do you need to install? And uh, because you're generating lots of data, then how do you summarize those data? Now, it's not something people haven't thought of before, but now I think we're, we're just coming to the stage where um, we have the technology that can do these kinds of things. Um, I think the issue is, is where do you put your effort? Um, and you kind of alluded to this, where, where, where do you start? Um, and that's a big issue. So maybe the first thing to do is to sort of say, well, what should we concentrate on? What's likely uh, to bring us big benefits? Um, 
and um, let's go for that first. Okay. So Good. thanks again very much.